Welcome back to the Los Angeles Times Book Festival here on the campus of USC on uh, a beautiful weekend here. And now we're gonna turn to, well, we must turn to poetry, yes. right? Finally. Yes. And I'm really pleased to welcome back Robin Cost Lewis, who we've talked for a number of times over the years, so yes. it's really nice, nice to see you. Thank and you. Evie Shockley, our first time talking. Welcome nice to, to both be of here. you. Thank you. The, uh, can I ask first about a festival like this? With, um, I mean, there is a place for poetry. Do you feel it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah, the poetry tent has been full and the applause has been loud. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's uh, LA readers love poetry. That's what's so great. So they come out for poetry as much as they do as anything else. But you've been doing this all over the place now, right? The yes. last few years. So yeah. you're. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but 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 what I mean, what do you see in terms of audience or interest or uh, enthusiasm? In terms of poetry? Yeah, yeah. I see lots of interest and enthusiasm. That's what's so lovely. Anywhere you go, people are reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gone from, you know, I mm -hmm. go to Paris every summer and do a reading there to towns I can't, that were so small I don't remember them, and mm -hmm. we drove by in a night, and there's always a big audience for poetry. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's more, it's the, one of the oldest art forms that human beings know, yeah. you know, so I'm not surprised. What's, the, what's your experience? I feel like American poetry is in a renaissance. Yeah. Um, things are, are just blooming. It, uh, excitement about poetry is coming from the number of students who are taking creative writing classes, not necessarily with the intent to become poets, but because they want to find a way to express themselves creatively. And that leads them to engage with um, writers who are out there doing uh, maybe more serious art. It's wonderful. Have you thought about why it's happening? Why do you think? Mm, I think there was a, a democratization of writing that began uh, decades ago, but that has picked up steam and uh, piggybacks on some of the democratization of the university as a whole. And I don't think it's only happening in the university, but it, it, it's where the university comes uh, in contact with the public. Uh, I teach at a public institution, and mm -hmm. so for me, those two come together um, significantly. Yeah. 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 I also think it's because um, there have been so many organizations that have cropped up um, with the intention of changing mm -hmm. or making American literature more inclusive. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Cabot exactly. Canham, of which Evie and I are both, um, have our graduate fellows and faculty yeah. um, are a part, and just so many others, Kundiman, yes. I mean, I can just go name so yeah. many. Uh, and the MFA, certainly. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, my favorite junior colleges and um, YMCAs and YWCAs and... Public libraries. Public libraries. There's so much going on about poetry in the world, and it's really exciting. You have taken on, we were just talking, you mentioned the word public. Yeah. You've taken on a very public role now. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. So what, is, what are you doing with that? Well, I'm trying to uh, think about the role of Poet Laureate as a role of service, which I really love, of public service. Um, so I'm trying to serve Los Angeles City with poetry as much as possible. Um, and that means anything from going from um, readings and workshops in prisons to readings and workshops for older people in different kinds of mm -hmm. assisted living facilities or high schools, or I'm judging a high school slam, which I can't wait for Get Lit. Love I love the youth poets. Or um, And then the thing I'm most excited about is I I'm going to design, in collaboration with the Los Angeles Public Library, I guess it's great, I get to announce it here. Go for um, it. Can I go for it? Yeah. I'm make so some excited. News. <laughs> I'm going to make some news. I am going to, um, with Los Angeles Public Library, launch a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the city of Los Angeles through poetry. So what that means, okay, let's pause for applause. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. Truth um, and Reconciliation through poetry. Right. Yeah. So I'll probably call it something like Poetic Truth and Reconciliations. But to address uh, all the communities, or as many as possible, I'm going to try, I'm going to kill mm -hmm. myself trying, that uh, have very complicated 
histories with the city and county of Los Angeles. This place is an incredible place of migrations of so many kind from so many places. We're on the Pacific Rim. We're on the border of Mexico. We used to be Mexico. So hmm. for example, um, I think one of the first ones that we're planning on doing is to honor all the different Native American and First Nations that were here before when Mexico was Mexico, right? Yeah. So, um, or the disabled community or the queer communities or mm. you name it, I'm gonna try to celebrate them and mm. their histories here in LA. So I'm very excited about that. And I'll continue while doing that series to go on um, doing readings and teaching classes at different That's community really services. That's really exciting. Yeah, I'm I really excited. Your... I know, I'm really yeah. excited. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Do you, th do, you, or do, you, do you feel this, um, not all poets or writers feel like that they, they need to be that public about mm. they, what they do? No, that's absolutely not the case. And poetry, uh, people come to it for many reasons. But I, uh, I definitely write to share and to reach audiences and to get people yeah. thinking about um, the, some of the things that concern me. So, and, and I write poetry that's outward facing in that uh -huh. sense, yes. thinking about issues that um, connect to a wide range of social kinds of uh, injustices and social problems, things. Um, poetry is, for me, a place for asking questions. And so it allows me to put my questions out there and have other people enter the conversation and talk talk solutions, talk possibilities. I, I, I saw, I didn't know this about you, but you got a... a a law degree. I did. Were you a practicing lawyer? <laughs> yes, for a short period. Yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? <laughs> I did. Um, it's, it's it's somewhat ancient history now, but it was, I think it was an influence on my work. Um, I, I learned from the law and a, a certain appreciation for language. Um, it's slipperiness, it's mm -hmm. um, possibilities for ambiguity, um, the ways that people, the ways that it shapes the world that we live in, and um, what used to um, what used to be my job was shaping language to try to shut down those possibilities mm -hmm. and and to try to protect a client. What I do in my poetry, however, is to exploit um, or magnify those possibilities and try to um, open up and reveal what language does and open up and reveal its possibilities for for change. Yeah. So, I mean, even the content uh, crosses over, yeah? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, one of the poems that I uh, have in the, the book Semi-Automatic is a response to Citizens United, yeah. um, a, a way of asking people to think about what it means that the Supreme Court has... Um, identified corporations as citizens of this country. You can ask questions about that in a poem in a different way yeah. than uh, than in a news article, for example. Yes. Yeah. Shall we do that? Let's. I mean, let's hear something. I want to hear yeah. both of you. Yeah. Go ahead. Who wants to go first? You want to go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead Evie, since you were talking about yeah. that. Uh, that poem, let's see. Well, Evie's flipping. Yeah. I just want to take the opportunity to say that I'm one of her largest most devoted fans. It is a mutual fan Every club. Every time I there was see one. Evie publish a poem, I'm always, you know, I kind of gasp before I read it, hold my breath. Stop. So good. Um, so this poem um, in which uh, I, I question that uh, decision is called Philosophically Immune. Can I deduce the nature of humanity? from the relationship of American and multinational pharmaceutical corporations to African women with HIV? Is it natural to test pharmaceuticals on people who are citizens of less powerful nations, members of a devalued gender, representatives of a maligned race? Is it logical? Is it cost effective? Is the nature of the relationship of American and multinational corporations to African women with HIV economic or human? Economic or humane? Are African women with HIV human? Are African women human? Are Africans human? Are American and multinational pharmaceutical corporations human? Are American corporations human? Are Americans human? 
Are American corporations citizens? Are Africans American? Are African Americans multinational? Can humans have a relationship to American and multinational pharmaceutical corporations? Are corporations corporeal? Are corporations real? Are corporations corpses? Are corporations gendered? Are women representative? Are humans incorporated? Are humans pharmaceutical? Is HIV pharmaceutical? Is nature pharmaceutical? Is nature humane? Is nature natural? Are nations natural? Are nations raced? Are nations corporations? Are nations cost-effective? Is nationality a test? Can I deduce the humanity of the listener from the relationship of the listener to American and multinational pharmaceutical corporations? Can I deduce the nature of the listener from the relationship of the listener to African women with HIV? Mm. Well, that literally asking the questions, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That In would make case. for an interesting Supreme Court uh, <laughs> argument. Right, right. If only, huh? If only, <laughs> if only. Um, the, I hope the thing that gives me hope is that Supreme Court decisions have been reversed in our history, um, and the precedents don't always yeah. have to stay written in stone. So mm -hmm. I, I hope this is a decision that they'll revisit and um, and think, you know, think about again in light of what that decision has meant for our democracy. Yes. Robin, you want to read something? Sure. Um, what I love, too, about what you just read, Evie, is that it also uh, gives the reader and the listener an experience of the power of poetry mm -hmm. to ask exactly those questions that you don't see asked in that way in any other place. Well, and to use the words that right. you don't see in poetry either. Exactly. Pharmaceutical. Exactly. I mean, that's not a word we usually exactly. use it's in poetry, right? Exactly. Poetic. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read a poem called Mother Church Number no. 3. Mm -hmm. um, it's written after the Yellow House in uh, Chaco Canyon in the Anasazi ruins from 1125 to 1130, and I wrote it for my son. It's called Mother Church Number no. 3. Mm. You step down into the flat world, then ask me to say it, to explain how our name can mean both ancestor and enemy. Your body begins in four directions. Here, one calendar takes 18 years. I am three. One day is an eyelash. Your body is a segment of prehistoric road, a buried stairwell with only the top stair obvious. We are alluvial, obsidian. Sometimes the ground swells with disappointment. Sometimes we know our mountains will be renamed after foreign saints. We sing 900-year-old hymns that instruct us in how to sit still for 49 years through a 50-year drought. We climb down through the hole anyway and agree to the arrangement. Mm. It's fascinating to listen to both. I mean, one is, uh, is of the moment, and you're doing what you've done so wonderfully here, is going back through history and time and right. connecting different histories. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, Evie, both of our books and both of our projects and all of our work, I think we often go back and forth through yeah. history and try to bring it forward. I'm not really very good at... Uh, talking and engaging the present. I'm not. I'm, 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 the past is where I live, and okay. preferably one or two millennia away really <laughs> makes me happy. <laughs> Scan Sanskrit scholar. <laughs> <laughs> Distance from right. human beings is a really good thing at times yeah. in order well. to see history clearly. Um, whereas I think, I was just thinking about your poem, Ode to Shirley Chisholm, which I love yes. so much, that first was published in Harvard. It's a poetry magazine. Yeah. Um, Evie has a incredible skill of engaging the, uh, the present moment lyrically, and, but without, as the poem that you just read, I think, shying away from the kind of sterility of the rhetoric with which we engage it, and that's a great gift. To think Tell about, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, just to think about um, 
the the past and the present as as interconnected is the the real heart of my project but yeah. i think that's true in your work too mm -hmm. the i mean your centerpiece poem takes us through from that like millennia ago moment um through western art um to to the very present moment and what we see is the <coughs> unbroken line yeah um your your work just tell me in our, last, in our last minute or two here, uh, you're talking about engaging with the world, but you're both teachers too, yeah. yes. right? Yeah. Engaging with students. I mean, what is the, what is the lesson? I mean, there's, this is what you do, right? Yes. So this would go on and on. But I mean, is there a lesson or two, something that you want to impart to students? Mm. Certainly. Mm. I mean, for me, that poetry, what I try to engage with my students most of all is what is distinct about poetry as opposed to mm. all the other subjects that they're taking, mm. right? And what's distinct is the door that poetry offers everyone um, who tries to write it or who reads it, um, tenderness mm. about every sort of engagement, every sort of situation, every sort of historical context or politics. You know, there's a poetic term called the turn, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully your poems have them, where, you'd <laughs> where you see a moment right. that you didn't see coming mm. arrives for you and hopefully mm -hmm. takes the floor from, uh, up from under your feet. Mm -hmm. um, that also must take place in the writer as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I try to teach my students uh, about vulnerability and trying to meet humanity uh, without a mask. Wow, yes. I mean, um, I think along with tenderness, attention. Yeah. I mean, poetry creates a space that's not out of time, but it, it slows time down, allows you to go in and really um, see something, if it's yeah. a lyric description, or um, enter the language, if it's a more experimental poem, and, and think and feel at a pace that we don't often get to yeah. to explore in this uh, fast-paced world that we <laughs> live in. All right. Well, I envy the students. Yeah. Thanks. Evie Shockley, Robin Cost-Lewis, thank, thank you both you. very much. Thank, thank you. you.